Well, it's good to see everyone tonight. I'm so glad that you're here. When you tell a church uh, early in the week that we're moving toward a night like tonight, and you're going to be asked to publicly confess and repent of sin, you begin to kind of uh, scatter your, uh, your crowd just a little bit. Uh, but because never has there ever been a genuine revival without open public repentance of sin, because of that, I have felt strongly compelled to lead every church God opens the door for Terry and I to serve in to a night just like this. Uh, if you're here as our guest, and some of you are friends of ours and friends of this church that have driven in, we're so glad you're here. Will you do us this favor, and would you pray for us tonight um, as a congregation? This meeting primarily is for the fellowship of this church. If you're home watching tonight, and you were a little afraid to come, wondering what this North Carolina preacher was going to ask of you, um, then we understand. I would encourage you, if there's a, a styrofoam cup anywhere near you in the house, that you get it. If you don't have that, get a piece of paper or something so you can be a part of this meeting tonight with us here, especially if you're a part of the uh, Hillsborough family. Uh, if you're watching online from someplace else, we're so glad that, uh, that you're tuning in. If you have your devices here, you might want to share with your friends because this could be a night that changes everything for some believers that have been carrying around some things that um, have long since needed to be repented of. I was thinking uh, such a heavy night. I've been under an unusual burden for this evening. And uh, if you can get a prayer through, I hope that you're praying tonight for the service. This is a key moment in a revival effort. Uh, I was going to tell you a couple of stories. One is a story that happened about two hours from here. We were having a preacher's meeting in Winchester, Kentucky, back when the Kentucky Fellowship of uh, Churches were gathering. And uh, there was probably, I'm going to say, 60 or 70 preachers present that morning. There were some probably from here, from Ohio as well. And I'll never forget, um, we had a missionary guest. Uh, we had some musicians. But that morning, um, the Lord really impressed upon our hearts that God was going to move unusually in that morning service. And I changed the message that God had given me, and I have a little message that I preach out of the book of Joel on repentance. And I felt compelled to preach it to those pastors. And I was about three-quarters of the way through the message, Pastor, when a man stood up in the back. I could call his name right now, but I'm not going to. Um, he's still a pastor in a different state right now. But he stood up in the back and he said, Brother Tom, can I say something? And I said, yes, you can. He said, the church that I lead, he called the name of the large city in Kentucky, he said, this time last year, there were 400 people in attendance in that church. He said, today, we're under 300. And he said, the attendance is declining all the while. And I know I'm part of the problem. And with brokenness, he comes down the aisle and falls into the altar. Another man stood up and he said, When I left my house this morning, uh, I remember uh, speaking harsh words to my wife. I slammed the door. And that was not the first time I'd spoken to her like that. And he said, God's convicted me this morning. Now look, when I tell you that sometimes it don't take a preacher to get the job done, when the Holy Ghost is doing His work in the church, and by the way, if you've been here some this week, can we say that we've experienced a little bit of that, amen or not? Now look, I, have we gotten all the way into the glory like we are wanting to and like we believe in God for? And that's His choice as to when He manifests Himself. If the glory of God is the essential presence of God in all of His splendor as He reveals Himself to man, it's His glory on display. If it's that, then what we have to do, what must happen, and by the way, then another preacher stood, and then another, and then one stood up and went and found another in the room that he, that he was jealous of, and he had said unkind things about, and he made that right, and the two of them together came to the altar. I remember looking over to the pastor, and he went like this. In other words, you just keep on. Uh, don't, it's not time to, to change anything else. And it was so cool, pastor, because there was a, a missionary guy there, 
In fact, he was, uh, I can't remember his name, he was with the Springfield um, uh, Missions Office. And uh, what was interesting is, instead of him getting up and making the pitch, uh, for all of you in the balcony, I want, I want to include you too, I, I don't want to mean to look down just here, but he, he uh, instead of just making the pitch for the special offering coming up, he was so in tune with what God was doing. We all recognized we were in the presence of God. And the Lord was speaking. And so I remember uh, distinctly what he did. He got up and he started testifying. And he had a son that was in a church, a New Spring Church, down in South Carolina. And, and this man began to weep. His son was dying. And God was speaking in that room. The work of God continued. It was crazy. When it was time, they had barbecue from some really good place uh, that afternoon for lunch. And nobody wanted to, to break for lunch. You know what I'm talking about? When you get in those places where God's at work and there's some things more important than eating. It was pretty sweet. We just stood there after the meeting and we were all kind of shuffling our feet a little bit because nobody wanted to go. And then one of the preachers said, you know, we're just a few miles from Cane Ridge where the revival broke out with Barton Stone. Does anybody remember that? You ever read that in, in the history? You might want to look that up, the Cane Ridge Revival. And there's some crazy stuff people have said happened there. And i tell you what I believe happened there. I believe the power of God fell there is what I believe happened. Because what, what occurred there is they would cut off the trees. And by the way, we went over there. We all piled on that bus that he had, a bunch of us. Not everybody stayed, but a lot of us went over there and we sang together and we shared together. We just wanted to savor that moment when we had gotten right with God and God was at work in our lives. I'm telling you, there's nothing like experiencing the presence of God, especially in a moment of repentance. I hope you've been praying and asking God. Last night, I preached on the departure of the glory. The first service on the glory desired. And then Sunday night on the glory displayed. Last night on the glory departed. And tonight I want to pick up where I left off in the glory departed. And I want to talk about what makes the glory depart. What keeps us from experiencing the manifested presence of God in our churches. Now let me tell you something. This is not going to be a running the aisles, hollering hallelujah kind of a service. There's going to be conviction in the room. And by the way, if you're the one thinking, I hope everybody else is getting this, uh, you're the one I'm targeting tonight. Uh, because the reality is, all of us, I've already written some things on the cup that I have. I, by the way, how many of you uh, got a cup when you came in the room? Hold them up so I can see them. I just want to make sure everybody has one. All right, good. In the balcony as well. How about you guys at the soundboard? You all have yours? Get two of them for... Uh, for old Tyler up there. He, he needs two if he can. Uh, one man asked me last night, said his wife leaned over to him. I'm not going to point him out. But he said, my wife leaned over to me. And she said, I'll have to send tomorrow to have something to put on my cup, she said. <laughs> Good heavens, I hope all of you aren't like that here in Hillsboro, Ohio. But no, we laughed about it a little bit. I, through the years, I've had men say to me, Pastor, can I get a big gulp cup? One of the big ones for my wife because she's going to need that. And I always say usually it's, uh, it's usually the other way around, my friend. But the to, to truth is, I'm going to ask you, anybody not get a cup? Every boy and girl needs one, every adult. Did anybody get missed? Boy, if not, we really did a good job. Young people, thank you. And, and the pastors, thank you. If anybody did not get one, please make sure you get a cup. And while I'm preaching tonight, here's the goal. Tonight, as I share some things with you that I see as sins in the church, would you be honest? Even if you're a guest tonight, I love every one of you, but I want to tell you, you're a mess just for the record, just so you know it. You, you don't have it all together, and I don't have it all together. I have to deal with my sin on a regular basis. I'm asking you to do the same thing. You might have noticed your pastors and others in these altars every night, and I want to challenge you to follow suit. Look here, if you, you got to make a choice on what you're going to do with your sin tonight. You're either going to continue in it and harbor it, and allow it to be uh, a hindrance in your life. Or you're going to confess it and forsake it. Now some of you are worried to death what I'm going to ask you to do. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that at the close of this invitation, uh, I'm going to ask you to come. We're going to bring section by section and folks out of the balcony. I'm going to ask you, and it'll be a public thing. I'm not going to ask you to read it publicly in front of everybody. I'm going to ask you to come and bring this cup and turn it upside down on one of these strips of wood around the front of this altar. And I'm going to ask you to crush it. Did you hear the phrase in the song our brother sang? Do you realize what Jesus did when he went to the cross? 
He paid for every sin. Every sin we would ever commit was future in that moment. But He prayed for our past sins. And uh, He covered them and washed them away. He, uh, he paid uh, the debt for our present sins and our future sins. Somebody told me not long ago, well, Pastor, if He's already paid for all them, why do we need to deal with ours? And I said, I don't know. You have to take that up with Him. He's the one that said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins. Here's what the Lord knew. And here's what I believe everybody in this room knows, if you're honest. We know, He knew that we would sin after we got saved. He knew you would sin after you got saved. You don't have to become a believer again. You're His child. But you do and you must come to Him in order to retain the kind of fellowship and communion, not the relationship, but the fellowship. We must keep our sins confessed. This is my favorite verse on it. I've already given it to you once this week. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's when you got saved. How many in this room could say, Pastor, I remember when He forgave me my sins when He saved me. Will you say amen right there? Amen. I know I'm saved. He forgave my sins. I know I'm saved. He, that, he, did you hear that? Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now listen to the next part. This is after you got saved. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nobody in this room, not one, that could live a sinless life. Impossible. And it is a humbling... By the way, unless you get honest, we talked about that early in the week, unless you get humble, you're not going to write those sins down on that cup. And you won't come in front of your church family with heaven knows who's watching online. And you won't come to bring those to the altar to say, God, I am sick of my sin. I agree with you that it grieves you. And you love me so much and I love you so much. I love you more than this sin. And I'm asking you to crush it. On one of, don't do it on the carpet. It won't mean the same thing. He won't even forgive you if you do it on the carpet. <laughs> no, that's not true. But it'll make, you, you'll understand what I'm talking about when we come. And, and it's important because, it, listen, what I hear this all the time. I get these emails all the time after the revival pastor. I can't tell you how freeing it was to not just say to God, how many times have we ever been in this cycle? We get convicted. The pastor preaches. We get convicted about a sin. We come down the aisle. We cry. We turn around and we go right back. We get in a cycle. And for a few days, we don't find ourselves in that sin. But then, before you know it, we find ourselves in that same cycle. We're saying the same things to our children or our spouse. We're neglecting time with God. And so something is wrong. What will change it? I'm telling you on the authority of God's Word, He has the power to change your life as it relates to ongoing sin in a believer's life. For some reason, God uses something simple like this. I want you to notice something with me in Matthew. Are you in Matthew chapter 3? I'm not really going to preach tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of truth. But tonight's a night to repent. We've been building toward this. I think you're ready. I think some of you have already come. Guns loaded. You're, you're ready to repent. God's been speaking to you. And that glory is appealing to you. You're thinking to yourself, Hey, I, you know, I'd like to have a little of that glory in my marriage. I'd like to experience a little glory in my Sunday school class. We, we haven't really experienced God like we could. I think I'd like to experience a little glory in my family. Or, and not to say the church. Now, I haven't painted many pictures, but I want you to imagine with me, Pastor, a whole different atmosphere. And people flooding through the doors, drawn by the Spirit of God, because the glory of God is residing here. You know what the Lord said? When I'm lifted up, I'll draw men to me. Now, I hear these kind of things all the time. And so what we're talking about is the importance of repentance. Can I tell you the first message that John the Baptist ever preached was repentance? Look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at, look at uh, verse 8 now, please. And the Bible says, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for what? Repentance. 
Look down to verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. But did you notice that repentance precedes the baptism of the fire of God in the life of a believer? But not only was this the first message John ever preached, John the Baptist, but would you look over to chapter 4 and verse 7, and I believe I can make a good case for repentance being the first message that Jesus ever preached. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and uh, notice with me in verse, uh, let's look at verse 7. Jesus, uh, no, verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Someone has said that the American church doesn't really need God because they have people and they have money. And that really uh, makes it look like there's a church present. Can I tell you every gathering of people is not a church by New Testament standards. In reality, it might look like a church, but it not be a church. Before I preach to believers tonight on the matter of sin and just share some things that I see in churches across our land, and I'm talking, by the way, wherever we go, week after week, for the last six weeks, we've been in five churches in six weeks. That's very unusual. We don't, we don't go quite that much, but God has made it very clear that was something we were supposed to do for the last few weeks. <clears throat> but what I notice is the same people are in every church. They just got different names and different faces. We all struggle with our sin. We're all human. We're all tempted by the same devil. And therefore, there are struggles at every place. But before I get into the believers, I have a major concern, a great concern, that many of the people, Pastor, who attend our churches and some whose names are on the church roll have never truly been born again. I'm talking about changed. If we wonder why some of our young people have no desire for the things of God, for the Word of God, they're not drawn by the Spirit of God, they can continue in their sin and not feel conviction. I don't think the problem is they need revival. Now, I'm thinking of that woman that told me not long ago in a meeting of her son and the wicked life that he's leading without any chastisement at all. He's in prison. Uh, I believe it was for child molestation. But preacher, don't worry, he's saved. He got saved when he was a little boy. And I, I want to say, I don't want to disillusion you. But if you never saw fruit in his life in the first place, there's a very good chance he never got in in the first place. But I, I'll read you this quote. If you know something is a sin and you continue in it and you delight in it, you take pleasure in it with no chastisement at all, you have good reason to believe that you are lost. I'm going to read that one more time just to be sure if there's one person in this room or watching the live feed tonight or will watch it at a later time that's hanging on to some little profession. But down deep you know that there's nothing real going on in your soul. If you know something is a sin, you continue in that sin, you delight in that sin, you take pleasure in it with no chastisement, you have good reason to believe that you are Lost, Manly Beasley said. Well, I want to share with you some sin tonight, some things that God has laid upon my heart. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. The Lord woke me again uh, this evening or, or this morning early, late last night, and uh, placed some passages on my mind. I, I just want to share them with you, and I hope that you will do an honest Evaluation. We're going to pray right now first before we read even the first scripture. And I want you to join me in asking God, Lord, search me tonight. Search my heart. Try me and know my, uh, my, my thoughts, my heart. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I already feel opposition, Lord. I know the devil hates it when we come to you with our sin, when we get honest. 
And then we open up our hearts. Lord, thank you for showing me mine some today. And Lord, if you reveal more tonight, I'll stop what I'm doing and get that pen and I'll write it because I'm tonight going to come and bring some things before you. And Lord, I pray for every young person in this room and for those adults and grandmothers and granddads that struggle. Lord, that think they've got somebody fooled. Lord, thank you that we don't have you fooled. And I ask you in the strong name of your son Jesus that you'll send the Holy Ghost in power in the lives of everybody in this room. And I pray we'd be so honest with you, Lord, that we would write down those things, humble ourselves, and then come and bring them to you in this altar for removal of our sin tonight. We ask that and we believe it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Colossians chapter 3 beginning in uh, verse, well, let's start in verse 8. The Bible says, But now you also put off these, th these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. These are some things that need to be on some cups. Lie not one to another seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Would you turn back to Isaiah and um, keep your finger in Isaiah chapter 5? Isaiah chapter 5, and before we get to Isaiah chapter 5, can I mention a few others in addition to the anger and the wrath and the malice, and the envy and the unforgiveness? I was thinking about something today, I... I was gone, Pastor, in a meeting a few weeks ago, and there was a situation that happened in the life of some people that I love. And um, I had an opportunity, and to be frank with you, it slipped my mind, number one. And number two, I thought the pastor on call, the one on call of our staff, would handle it. Well, neither took place. And I got an email expressing hurt that I had caused in someone's life. Now, I want to tell you something. Listen to me very carefully. There have been times where I've excused that and I've said, hey, I'm busy and I, it just happens I'm human. But no, oh, I hurt them people. So I had to ask God to forgive me. I asked the Lord, if I hadn't already dealt with it, I'd have it on this cup. Lord, I neglected my responsibilities in that area. I repented before God first and then I sent an email <clears throat> across several states. And I said, would you please forgive me? <clears throat> I was wrong about this. I want you to forgive me. Then I, I uh, expressed from that individual to her family, I said the same thing. Guess what? It's been three weeks now. No response whatsoever. Let me tell you why. Because I had a responsibility to ask forgiveness, to confess my sin. But then when I do so, they have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. If you're holding on to any unforgiveness whatsoever from anybody, Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know about my first marriage. You don't know about... Let me tell you something. I know this. I know the Lord says, forgive, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. It's your responsibility. God never will ask you to do anything. When He asks us to repent, He'll never ask you to do that if you don't have the capacity to repent. If it's not best for you to repent, He'll never ask you to forgive unless it's best for you to forgive and you have the capacity to forgive. Tonight I'm just asking you to do what God's asked you to do. I was thinking of the family today and I, I had a, a few things written down. Listen to this. These are some things that some husbands need to say to their wives. I haven't shepherded you very well. I haven't listened to you. I haven't protected you. I haven't spent time with you. It's been a long time since we have been out on a date. I've taken you for granted. Uh, I, I've uh, worked so much that I have, have neglected my, my marriage and my family. You say, oh, that's not a sin. I work hard for my family. It is a sin. It's a wrong. It's wrong to neglect each other. So I hope that, I, by the way, I like feeling conviction. Don't think you're going to make me, make me feel bad by giving me the stink eye because I actually like it when that happens on this particular night. It means that the target I'm aiming for is getting hit. And somebody told me years ago, you had dogs, hunting dogs and all, see if this is true, that if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. Is that true or not? If it is, then I'm aiming. I'm aiming tonight. And I'm doing it because I love you. And, and because God loves you. And you don't need to carry these things any longer. 
but, but I, I know husbands are neglecting. Well, wives, what about this? Have you ever has said to God, I'm not respecting my husband the way I should? Have you coveted somebody else's husband and thought to yourself, if I only had someone like him? Let me tell you something. If you ever lived with him, you might not appreciate it quite as much. You, you might not understand. Everything that glitters is not gold. I promise you that. Every now and then somebody says to me in our church, Pastor, if I, I look around and all these people seem to have it together, I said, I like to say to them, Look here, honey, I've been the pastor of this church for 37 years. If you knew half what I know, you wouldn't worry about that anymore. Every one of us are sinners. And just because we repented when we got saved doesn't mean we're finished. Martin Luther said, We're going to be repenting all the way to the gate. So wives, many of them need to say, I, Lord, forgive me, I haven't respected my husband. Or, or to my husband, forgive me, I haven't honored you. I haven't followed you. I haven't, uh, I haven't worked at, at my personal appearance. There's some men need to say that same thing too. You say, well, hey, wait a minute, you're meddling now. No, let me tell you something. Look here. Uh, you and I need to do the best we can with what we got. I'm sad for Terry. I really am. I, I grieve for her. <laughs> I'm not aging gracefully. Can I just say that? How, however, however, the reality is I do the best I can with what I have. She picks out things for me and I wear them even though I probably would never have worn some of the things that I have on tonight uh, were it that I got to choose those kinds of things. But I know this, the Bible says, I believe I read this, that my body belongs to her. Did you remember seeing that in the Bible somewhere? <laughs> I don't care if you say amen or not either. I'm going to hammer. If you don't, I'm going to go on a little further on that same truth. I believe that's what the Bible says. In fact, I know that's what it says. And hers belongs to me. Now let me meddle one little bit further and then I'm going into some, some other things other than the family. If you think you and I are right with God and you haven't touched your wife, or your husband in a long time, can I just tell you, don't fool yourself on this. Make every excuse you want to make about the children, about your schedule, about everything else. And then you go back to Romans chapter, chapter uh, uh, first, or 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when the Bible says, don't neglect each other, don't defraud one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. And then after that's over, come back together. Come back together. There have been some people in this room that have told me in the last few months they've sent their spouse home to heaven. I want to tell you if they ever had an opportunity again to love and to show love, they would love to have that opportunity one more time. And God is grieved and the church suffers when we sin against our spouses. I wonder if we're praying for each other. Write that down if you're not. If you're not praying for your children, praying for your spouse, neglect of the time in God's Word. And I told you that idolatry is a major issue. I was reading the Ten Commandments all over again. Who uh, You know uh, uh, full well that they start with, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We can't even get past the first one. Because as a generation and as a culture, we are idolatrous. Whether you believe it or not, even though you don't bow down to a statue, and I don't bow down to a statue, listen to me, church. And I love you and Jesus loves you. But the truth is, we make things way more important than they ought to be. We think we've got to have something. We've got to go somewhere. We've got to order this and order that. And we've got so much of what we don't need that it's ruined us. You go to other places in, on mission fields where people have little or nothing and they're wondering what they're going to do the next day for a meal. And you'll find a bunch of people that have faith in God and walk with Him. The Lord has blessed us to the point where we have turned our backs like last night to the temple and began to worship other gods. I told you the three predominant gods in this culture are money, power, and sex. All three good things within marriage, the last one. All three good things, but when they become a God thing, they are a sin. Are you writing down anything on your cup? Has God spoken to you? Keep Put it in your hand so you'll be able to identify. And by the way, the only way you won't be able to is if you say, well, I don't have any sin. Maybe the Spirit of God speaking to you on something different than what I'm talking about, but I'm going to tell you, dealing with sin is a biblical matter. I was thinking about just money, for instance. Here's some sins related to money. If you've got some of it, and you don't ever give it to somebody that's poor, and you don't ever help somebody that's struggling, you've got an issue, and you need to repent of that. If you don't have it, and you're a little bitter because God hadn't given you what you think you ought to have. You've got a little problem with it, and you need to deal with your sin. 
if uh, all you are consumed with is getting all you can and canning all you get and sitting on you can, I'm telling you, you have a problem with money. And money's a good thing, nothing wrong with money. As long as it's in fact, look at Isaiah chapter 5 where we are. There's a statement about this here in the fifth chapter. And I've got to hurry, but I want you to notice several times that the phrase, Woe is me, occurs. Verse 8, Isaiah 5 verse 8, Woe unto them, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Did you see the sin? Here's the sin in that day, and it's the same sin today. It's a sin, listen to this, of materialism. We don't just want one place. We want one, and then we want another, and then we want another, and then we want another. Pastor, is it a sin to own many lots? Is it a sin to own more than one property? Nope. But look at the last part of that verse, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. These are people that are consumed with what they have. Let me tell you how you know it. When the stock market crashes, or we have a major issue, and they lose a lot of money in one day, they just about lose their mind. Because their faith is in their money and the New York Stock Exchange. Where I I tell you some of the happiest people I've ever seen are those ones that don't have two nickels to rub together. It don't matter what happens on Wall Street. All they're concerned about is what's on Broad Street or wherever they live. They're, They're not consumed with it. And here's the issue. If God's blessed you with money, listen to me. Look for opportunities to invest that in the gospel work in this church. You know, I, I listen, look for God opportunity to invest it in God's people. Look for opportunities to invest it in ministries where the gospel of Jesus Christ will go forward. But if you're not doing that, that can become an issue. Money and control and sex. Listen to this one. Coldness and dryness and debt. You know why people can't give, Pastor? A few years ago we did that financial peace class, uh, Dave Ramsey. And I forget how much, I think it was something like $300,000 of debt was removed during that 13-week class in our church. And guess what happened? Not only were they paying off all that money, but weeks after that, we started charting the giving. Anybody want to have an idea of what happened in the giving? It started going up. You know why? And by the way, I ain't consumed with money. This preacher's not consumed with money. We've not talked anything about what we get. If I get more than five dollars, I get more than I'm worth at any meeting I go to. So I never, I never study it. However, I will tell you this right now: we get accused of it all the time. But I'm not consumed with it. But in my heart, what I see is people don't give because they felt like they had to have that new car with an extra tail light on it more than the neighbor had. Or they needed that new camper or that new boat and they couldn't pay for it. So they got that card out and they went zing like that right there. And because they zinged it, they got themselves in debt. Now look, I ain't mad at you if you're in debt. But I want to tell you, God can help you get out of debt. And then when you get out of debt, don't make no more zings until you can pay for what it is you're trying to get. Debt can become a sin. And many, for many, it is definitely a sin. Look back to uh, chapter 5 real quick. Lord, help me get through this now. Look at verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord. Did you see the second one? This is pleasure-seeking. These are, these are Christ, listen, these are God's people that just have to go somewhere every weekend. They have to go something bigger and something newer and eat at a nicer restaurant and more and more and more. Are you looking at your cup? I'm talking about having to, just looking for heaven. I told my wife, I said, honey, I don't want us to spend our life trying to go somewhere to, create, to, to meet a need of something we're going to have when we get to heaven. You're never going to find heaven down here. You're not going to find it at the beach or the mountains. You're not going to find it in any other city or any resort. You're not going to find it. It's never going to come for the saint until we get home to heaven. Amen. And I want to tell you something. Listen to me. If we're not careful, we'll buy into everything the world's doing. We think because they're saying it and they're going there, we need to say it and we need to go there. Now look here, I'm not talking about not enjoying some of the blessings God gives us. I'm simply saying following it and being consumed by it can be a terrible sin of the church and it's robbing us. Look down a little further. There's a major one coming up at verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were 
with a cart rope. I want you to imagine with me the sin. By the way, my sin's private between me and God. I'm not going to tell you what I wrote on my cup. If I see anybody sneaking up here around my cup and trying to read what's on there, I'm going to shoo you away from my cup. Nobody's going to come up here and read all these tonight. In fact, when they're done, we, I want you to leave them there. When you, but then we're going to come through with a bag and they're going to clean up every bit of them and take them and put them in the trash. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. I want you to imagine my sin. If I took the, the worst sin that the devil fights me with and that sometimes I fail in and I put it on a cart and tied a rope to it and put a neon sign brightly and I tried to pull it across this platform but I didn't stop pulling it across the platform for all of you to see. I took it downtown Hillsboro and all 14 people that are down there right now, I show it to every one of them. Are you listening to me? Because I wasn't ashamed. I don't care what you say. I don't care what God says. This is something that's, it, that's mine, and I'm going to do it, and I'm not ashamed of it. That's what he's talking about here. It's the sin of rebellion. Have you seen it? We saw the sin of materialism, the sin of pleasure-seeking, and now we see the sin of rebellion. But look at verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Put darkness for light and light for darkness. Put, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But what sin is that, Pastor? Well, that's the sin of relativism. You ready for this one? Hey, look, Brother Tom. Now, you're older, and, and uh, you young people might think this way. It might be a sin for you. You're a preacher, but it's not a sin for me. I can get by with it. Uh, I, I'm at a little different place, and God, it looks at me different, and He allows me to uh, participate in that. Uh, I remember uh, a man, a very famous man, who was on a nationally televised uh, church program uh, years ago that uh, most everybody in this room would know the man's name and the TV program, if I mentioned it, one of the early ones. This man was a musician. He had seven children. One of those children were special needs. And we, this man was found in immorality. And you know what his thinking was? I'm, a, I'm an important, I'm close to God. He allows me to do this. It's the sin of relativism. It's the same sin of the famous Christian apologist that within the last few weeks has been identified as a sinner over the years. You say, what's different about him than me? Not one thing. The difference is you and I all still have a sin nature and it's a matter of whether we are willing to bring our sin to God and say, Lord, I'm sick of it and I'm turning from it and I'm asking you to take your power and remove it from my life and our, our home. Notice the next sin is in verse 21. I'm almost done. In fact, this is the last one here. I'll name some others and we'll be done. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from them now, wise in their own eyes. I would say that is the predominant sin. It's the sin from which all others come, the sin of pride. Pride is killing our churches. Pride will be what keeps you from repenting of your sin tonight if you don't. Pride will keep you from walking down an aisle making things right. Pride will keep you from going home and sitting down with your little family and saying, children, daddy wants to tell you I've been angry and I've done wrong. Or looking your wife in the eye and repenting of a failure in your marriage. It'll be pride. Pride keeps preachers from acknowledging the need that they have to call their church to revival. Pride keeps preachers from calling themselves to a place of repentance and a need for God. Pastor, what, what are some ones you see in the church? I see laziness and selfishness. I see greed and distance. I see prayerlessness. Oh, how sad. I see hard words and mouths that are out of control. People that say things and then they laugh when they say them. <laughs> like your sarcasm is something God honors. Can I tell you something? Don't ha 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 with me after you just jab me with a knife. I had to tell a man that one time. I said, your little, your little snicker after you get through don't make your words any less lethal. You can keep your little daggers to yourself. I'm not interested in them anymore. You've hurt me one time too many, and I forgive you this time, but now step away. S step away. I'm talking about sin. <clears throat> Pastor, what, 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 are we, what are we dealing with? Did you know 
Remember the elder brother? What was the sin of the elder brother in the prodigal son story? How about this? Self-righteousness. I'm glad he's preaching that. I'll tell you some of our members, Pastor. They need to hear that. <clears throat> I hope y'all heard that tonight. I'm telling you, I'm thinking about it. Where is so-and-so? He should be here tonight. He needs this. No, you need it. You need it. I need it. The sin of self-righteousness. Oh, Lord, thank you. I get to see some conviction in the room and some sweet work that you're doing. You remember the sin of the younger brother? He was so selfish. He just wanted more sin. He wanted more than he's sick and tired of living on that farm. He wanted what the world had. Young people, are you listening to me? This world will tell you, you can't have joy and love God and honor Him and be in the church and follow your mom and dad. They'll tell you, you need to go out. You need to go where the others are going. You need to go to the clubs. You need to, you need to go where they're partying. You need to go to the, the parties where your friends are because that's where it's really all about. Listen to me. Those days will take you to some sad places. The young woman that is one of the leaders at the Liberty Godparent home was a teenager in our church, and I remember this as clear as if it were yesterday. She stood up and sang a song uh, on the previous Sunday morning a week. She was one of my favorite, still one of my favorite young people. I love that young and so much, and she was getting pressure from everybody at school. She was very attractive. She was a junior in high school. And I'll never forget the day when that phone call came and her dad, who was anesthesiologist at the hospital, was so broken and he was weeping. He said, please, can you come right now? Can you come to our home right now? And I heard the urgency in his voice. When I got there, he and his wife were there. Their eyes are swelled. The little girl comes walking down the hall and literally buries her head right here in my shoulder. She's sobbing and weeping. And through her tears, she tells me of her condition that she's uh, with child. Her dad tells me the other weeks ago she was, she was off with some of her friends. We thought she was spending the night with her best friend, but instead they went to a party. And she had, listen to me, you say, oh, this is not true. No, it is true. Her first sexual experience. Out of order of what God had planned. And she got pregnant. She sacrificed so much. She went to the Liberty Godparent home and she wondered the child would be uh, a very popular young man on the campus who happened to be African American, was the father. And so here's a biracial child. In those days, a little more challenging to place in adoption. And, uh, and she wonders, will anybody, number one, will anybody want my child? Will anybody, she knew she was not in a condition to, to raise the child. Will anybody love me? Will anybody want me? And I can tell you God's grace is sufficient. She's a happily married woman with a beautiful family right now and leads one of the greatest ministries that they have on that campus. But here's the, here's the bottom line. It's a choice you will make. You and I get to choose whether or not we yield to the temptation. Over and over again we see it. Social media. I left my phone there. Can I tell you, we are consumed with it. We're spending too much time on those devices. We're looking and thinking of things we should never be looking at. And I'm not just talking about pornography. I'm talking, by the way, that's an issue in the church, Pastor. That's an issue in the church. I want to believe nobody in this church and nobody at Central, but I know that I've counseled with them in, I, in the congregation and the fellowship that I minister in. But it's not just those kind of adverse, dark things. I'm talking about just being consumed, looking at that live feed and how everybody else is living and where they're going and the lust and the covetousness and all that comes from that. I want to challenge you. Listen to me. If that thing is an issue with you, as it has been with me, just put it down. Turn it off. And make your mind up that you're going to spend time with God and not allowing the world to do your thinking for you. <clears throat> God speaking? Are you writing? We're almost finished. You know what? I love this verse. By the way, I wonder if there are any parents that need to say, and then I'm going to give you a closing verse. To your young people tonight, you know I haven't protected you as I should. I've given you freedoms. I've never checked your device. I have, uh, <clears throat> I've allowed you to to go places really basically because I, I thought I could trust you. You know something my kids always said to me, Daddy, you don't trust me. And I would say, you're 100% right. We don't. No, I don't. I don't trust your flesh. I hate the devil. Don't y'all hate the devil? 
I hate him. I hate what he tries to do. I hate what he's doing in my family right now in some people's lives. I hate the devil. But no, I don't trust their flesh. I still don't trust their flesh. I don't trust my flesh. That's why I built in safeguards to avoid these kind. I haven't protected you to your children as I should. I haven't prevented you from being in some situations. Please forgive me. I've not listened to you. We've not had conversations. I've let you come in and zone out and act like you could care less. And I've been intimidated with you. Hey, so many times young people run these families. Hey, you're a teenager, and I love you, young people. It's not your, you know that from the camps. <clears throat> it's not their job to lead your home. They're not to make the decisions. You lead them. One day, they're not going to stand before God with their lives. You're going to stand before God in the way you led your family. And some things need to change. Young people, some of you need to say to your mom and dad, I want you to forgive me for the way I've spoken to you. Forgive me for the way I haven't respected you and honored you, the way I've not wanted you around and I've acted, made you feel as if I could care less about you. One last little thought before I read my final verse. Did you know when that younger son, I've been meditating on it, I'm preaching it next week in a revival. You know that younger son, the prodigal boy, when he said, give me all things that pertain to me. You ask anybody in the Eastern culture, and let me tell you what they'll say to you. That don't happen. Because if you ever ask in that day, in that culture, give me my inheritance now, what you're really saying is, Dad, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Listen, I don't believe you hate, but boy, some of your parents are feel as if you do. Some of, our, some of our parents feel as if we do the way we treat one another. And I want to tell you just for the record, it's a terrible sin. If you're a single, listen, you've been hurt by being marginalized. You've put yourself in a situation. You need to forgive. You need to forgive yourself. You need to forgive others. If you're angry at God, you need to forgive Him. I wrote a sin on my cup, just the word excess. Be not drunk with wine, where does excess? I don't drink wine too much, but there are other things that I get too much of. Just excess. But here's the good news, and I didn't hear them all. I'll tell you what I love about the preaching on sin. I know this, the Holy Spirit, the best preacher. He's preaching all over this place and all over everybody. In fact, some of them already hit that little button. Boop. We're done with that. <laughs> uh, he said, go off social media, honey. Turn it off real quick, right while they're convicted. Just whoop, let's turn it off because I've heard enough. But listen to this word, 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. Look at verse 21. For he, God, hath made him Jesus. I'm going to wait and let you get there. I hear the pages turning. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, hath made him Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I read that the other day for the first time. You ever read something you've read over a hundred times, but you kind of read it for the first time and got it? Let me tell you what happened one day when Jesus went to the cross and He knew from the foundation of the earth He was going to go. God put Jesus on the cross and took every sin that we're going to bring in a moment to this altar, and every other sin you've ever committed, and every sin anybody's ever committed, and he put every bit of my sin on Jesus. All of it. Past, present, future. All of it. All of my sin on Jesus. But that ain't the best part of the story. Read on. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Look at this. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It's called the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. Not only did He put all my sin on Him, listen to this, He put all His righteousness on me. If I've got all His righteousness on me, how dare I go back to these rotten sins? Father, I've tried to do exactly what you told me to do tonight. In fact, I ain't tried, I've done it. I have to write, I had to write some sin down, Lord, I, and I'm sorry. 
please forgive me tonight as I bring them. I bring them in faith, believing that <clears throat> they'll be forgiven and that you're going to deal with them, Lord, and you're going to give me victory. Thank you for the faith. You said, watch her is born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And Lord, I believe it. And I believe you for victory in the lives of many a saint that will walk down these aisles in a minute. But Lord, by faith, I'm asking you to remove the pride and bring humility in its place. To bring honest men and women down an aisle, broken over their sin and the offense that it is to a holy God. Lord, I'm asking you to do this so that we can experience your glory in this church. Lord, if there ever was a day when our culture, when this city needs a church out here on this roadside where a cloud of your glorious presence is, it's right now. So Lord, in a moment when the music begins, I pray that this would be sweet-smelling savor to you. That you, God, would be pleased as your people deal with their sin. And that God, you would send your glory this way. And we'll thank you. In a moment, I'm going to ask those in the balcony to lead the way. I want those on both sides, outsides, to my far left and those to my far right to lead the way. You guys and those in the balcony that feel led to do it, I want to ask you to come. When they're finished, I'm going to give you the, the cue and those of you in the center section, I'm inviting you to come. And here's what I want you to do. Terry, will you join me? <clears throat> If you want to gather with your family, you can, however you feel led to do it. But here's what I want you to do. Believing that when Jesus came to the cross to pay our sin debt, He crushed. He dealt with and removed those sins. I want you to, to join us in this simple gesture. Watch this. Do it hard. Terry never can make hers pop. She tries to. Her sin's worse than mine too, but she never can make it. But I want you to crush it, and I want you to believe that He's forgiven you. I don't want you to stay in the altar this time because there are others coming. But then when you go back to your seat and sit down just for a minute before we close, would you just thank God for forgiveness? Lord, I've turned, and I've believed you, and I'm going to thank you for forgiving me. So guys, in the outside sections and up in the balcony, would you come? And go ahead and begin, if you will. Come on right now. God bless you. While others are coming and on these sides, find a place where the wood is and come. Bring those to Jesus. Grieve over them. Thank Him for what He's done. And then we'll call for those in the center. Push the cups out of your way, the ones that have already been crushed if you need space. And there's room over here. God bless you. Lord, thank you. Okay, now the two center sections as you feel led. Would you come? these things back I want you to remember the sound as others are coming remember the sound of that cup remember the night when you came and brought to God those things and believed Him to forgive you and 
heal you and remove those from your life. Pastor, you come and close the service as you feel led. The wonderful grace of God that saves us from our sin. Amen. The wonderful grace of God. It not only forgives us of our sin, but in fact knows that we'll still sin against him. He still loves us. Wonderful God. What a wonderful journey, huh? I was 17. Sylvia's in the service. I didn't know that she'd be my wife. I didn't know that she and I would make up a family and God would touch us. All because of his grace, the wonderful grace of God. Thank him for it. Amen. My God empower you with great victory over those challenges that you have. This morning in staff, we were talking about the service tonight, and I told the men, I said, you know, I'm in a battle every day to be clean and holy before God. Every day. Every day. I battle to stay holy before the Lord. Always a battle. Always want to be that way. Stay in close, holy presence. Glad you shared the night with us. Most unusual revival we've ever had. I, uh, it's just sweet to thank the Lord for the presence of the Lord upon our guest speaker and his wife, Terry. Shiggy said Terry's preaching was good as his today to the ladies' time. If he's touched your heart, you know, by the Spirit of God, you be sure and find him tonight. Find Terry, let her know that. If you've got things that need to be undone that the Holy Spirit spoke to you about, then do that. If there's somebody that you need to call, somebody you need to talk to, uh, you know, I, I keep short accounts. I just keep things as short as I can. And uh, I, I want to keep it that. I want to keep short accounts. So God, no doubt, has put things about people's hearts that they need to make right and do right, you know. Maybe there's things that, that don't belong to you, that you need to make right. Maybe you've got, you've got bitterness. Maybe you've got a pattern, a practice. Maybe there's somebody. Maybe it's the closest person to you. I don't know who that is. The Holy Spirit does. And the work of God is real. So we're seeing God move about our hearts and our lives in a unique way. And we just need to pray that God will continually work with us. Amen. Is there anybody that has a word tonight that maybe we ought to just uh, share with one another before I close in prayer? Is anybody that has something the Lord's put in your heart or on your heart that you want to share? If it's not real, we don't need to hear it or want to hear it, but if it's real, then we need to hear it. We need to have it. It's for our strength. Reba? Anybody else would have a word? Holy Spirit, speak to anybody? Okay. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your work about our lives. Thank you for the wonderful change that you made. Thank you, Lord, that we got to hear about your son. And we can live different in this world than ever ever before. Now for that one or two or three or five that would be here that are not saved, I pray that tonight you'll work about their heart, they'd be saved. Thank you, Lord, for each church member that's here, for our friends, our guests, our family that's with us tonight, might you in a very special way 
bless their lives for their presence. Have your way with us now and dismiss us, Lord, by your grace, in Jesus' name, and amen. God bless you tonight. See you tomorrow night.